Right, so good morning, everybody. Um, well, so following uh, Amanda and Victor, so uh, uh, no pressure team, so uh, quite a hard act to, uh, to follow. Um, but I'll just introduce myself, so, uh, and then uh, the, my colleagues on the panel, but um, my name's Gavin Boyle. I'm the chief executive of NHS South Yorkshire, uh, which is the ICB. And you know, for those of you, of you who don't know, South Yorkshire uh, is um, comprised of four places. So we've got two cities, we've got Sheffield, and Doncaster, and we've got two metropolitan borough councils uh, in Rotherham and Barnsley. And uh, I think it's fair to say that there's some considerable challenges when you look through a, a kind of population health, health inequalities lens uh, for the communities that we serve in South Yorkshire. It's probably one of the most uh, deprived uh, uh, systems uh, in, in the country. Um, you know, we've got high levels, so some, you know, 40% of the, the, the population uh, live in the, uh, uh, or exp experience life in the bottom quintile in terms of uh, deprivation. Big differences in terms of life expectancy, healthy life expectancy, etc., with the national average and huge variation across the patch. So, some real challenges. But what gives me um, a sense of optimism is the quality of, of relationships on the patch between, uh, I guess, health care uh, and academic institutions. So, whether that's the NHS providers working closely together or alongside our local authorities, the voluntary sector in our places. Um, but also with across South Yorkshire, the, uh, the South, York, South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined Authority. So Oliver Coppard, the recently elected uh, mayor for South Yorkshire, um, uh, re-elected, I should say, uh, is the chair of our Integrated Care Partnership. So there's a real sense of the system coming together uh, and bringing in uh, many different voices that help us focus on some of those wider drivers of, of poor health. And, and increasingly, uh, the, uh, the, our partnerships with academic institutions in, in, uh, in our, uh, our system are uh, increasingly important. So with the two universities, University of Sheffield, uh, Sheffield Hallam University, and also uh, with, uh, with commercial partners as well. And that's why um, you know, I'm really pleased to be here today to talk to you a little bit about how, we, how we're using one of our partnerships uh, uh, with a focus particularly on digital technology to address some of those challenges. So um, I'll, I'll introduce the panel. So uh, first of all, we've got uh, uh, Sue Thomas, who's uh, UK Director uh, for Google Health. Uh, hi, Sue. Hi. And uh, then we've got uh, Tim Chico, who is the, uh, the Director of the South Yorkshire Digital Health Hub, which is the, uh, the topic of our conversation uh, this morning. And then I'm delighted to introduce uh, uh, David Crichton, who's the, the Chief Medical Officer uh, for South Yorkshire, but is also a, um, uh, a practicing GP as well. Um, so just to mention, we've got Slido running, so um, what would be really great is for, if you've got any comments or questions or observations that you want to make, please put them on Slido, Slido and uh, I'll make sure we create some time towards the end of our, our conversation to, uh, to take some of your uh, thoughts and invite the panel to reflect on them. So without kind of further ado, I mean, I'm going to start with you, David. So I've, I've touched um, fairly superficially on some of the challenges that we face, but, you know, tell us more about that. What are, what are the, the characteristics of the, the South Yorkshire uh, system and the, and the people we serve? So as, as Gavin said, I'm, I'm a working GP. I've um, worked in South Yorkshire for about 20 years now, and... Uh, my practice is in an ex-mining community in, in a, a outskirts of Doncaster. Um, we've got 1.4 million people in Doncaster, and as Gavin says, that's spread ab across the conurbations of um, Barnsley, Doncaster, and Rotherham, which is typically the, um, the old coal fields east of the M1. And then we've got Sheffield as well, which people will be familiar with for a steel industry, and I'm sure people at home have got a cutlery that's, that's, that's made in Sheffield. Um, but, of course, that's all gone now, and... Um, you know, we have been impacted of, of recent, uh, um, you know, events. Um, so we have some strengths, though, and because we do have coterminosity with our um, local authorities, there's been lots of joint working that's been undertaken um, to, uh, you know, over the, the development of um, ICBs from, from clinical commissioning groups. And actually, we're fortunate, as Gavin says, is we actually are coterminous with our South Mayoral Combined Authority as well. So our borders align others, and that may sound very structural, but actually practically it can be quite helpful. Um, working with our partners, our vision for South Yorkshire is that everyone in our diverse communities lives happier, longer lives, and that's because that's a response to, as Gavin highlighted, um, life expectancy in South Yorkshire is less than it is in the England average by about two and a half years, but actually that's just the tip of it. When you look at the... Um, along any bus route that may run within our cities, 
you'll find there's a disparity of health, life expectancy of up to 10 years from the most deprived to the slightly more affluent areas. Um, so that, that, that's quite stark there. And we know that the contributory uh, illnesses that affect our communities are cancer, respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, um, because of the life um, that these uh, individuals live. After years and years of life expectancy improving, leading up to about 2019, we've seen a plateauing of that. And anybody who's read the UCL report from Health Equity panel will see that actually we're starting to see a decline in life expectancy. So once again, you know, that highlights the challenges we have. Um, alongside that, though, that's a, that even if you live well um, and do survive to a good old age, actually you live more years in, um, in poor health. And that can be for 20 years in some of our populations. Once again, a, a, you know, correlation to deprivation. Um, but once again, you know, high levels of diabetes, uh, mental health. Um, so when we connect that into our productivity as a community, these people aren't in work and, you know, um, you know we, we struggle to con for their contribution. Um, obviously, there are complex psycho social factors that influence our health behaviours, and we've got better understanding with our joint roles that we have across health and our local authority partners and our mayoral combined authority to better understand some of the drivers that fall outside of health. People will be familiar, only 10 to 15 percent of our well-being is determined by our health-seeking behaviour, and actually, you know, what will come up in this conversation, I'm sure, is the other 85 percent of those indices of multiple index of deprivation. Um, so we've got many challenges, but I, I remain optimistic. I'm, I'm proud to be a GP in Doncaster, and I do feel it's a real good, honest medicine. So in summary, there's lots to do to tackle our health inequalities and provide health equity. However, our biggest challenges are also our greatest opportunities. What we're going to discuss today is one of many programmes of work that we are um, addressing our health inequalities. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, David. So really clear statements of some of the challenges that, that we face in South Yorkshire. But I'm going to go to Tim next. So, so, so what exactly is the Digital Health Hub? What's your role and how does it, how might it help us with the sorts of challenges that David set out? Well, we were funded by UKRI, a major research funder uh, from government funding, in recognition that we have to do things differently uh, to address the, the challenges that have been described. So uh, we've been funded uh, initially for £4 million as one of the five national hubs that will do two things, pretty much. One is deliver skills and training across the piece to clinicians, to researchers, to industrial partners, to patients and carers, uh, and use that learning to co-develop new digital innovations that are equitable, that address the unmet needs of the region they're embedded in and, and beyond, uh, and kind of drive that forwards through to commercialisation and procurement in the NHS. Thanks, Tim. And have you got any examples of the sorts of areas that you might, um, you might be thinking about focusing on? Yeah, well, absolutely, but I mean, I think the first principle is engaging with our partners to do that. So that's one of the reasons that we're, as you know, in, in a relationship with the ICB, but also we're having citizens' juries. So we've spoken to uh, kind of people in Sheffield and we'll be doing it to, in the other places. You mentioned Doncaster, Barnsley, Rotherham to really understand what are their unmet needs. And, and you, know, you won't be surprised to hear that there's things about long t living with long-term illness, with communication, with accessibility to services, uh, and prediction of risk, and, and, and giving people control of their own kind of data and their um, health, uh, generally speaking. So uh, we're not setting an agenda as much as listening to the people who are at the front line, whether you be a patient or a clinician or an NHS organisation, and then working with them to develop the tools that address those. Thanks, Tim. And, and I, I guess coming to, to Sue next, I mean, from Google's perspective, I mean, what's in it, what's in it for Google and what does, what does Google bring to the party? So, um, th thanks, Gavin. Uh, just want to say Google Health is delighted to be back at Confed Expo. Um, what, a, what a great event this has been so far. Um, and I'm really proud that we're showcasing our, our partnership with the South Yorkshire region. It's probably the favourite thing I've done in my time at Google. So wh why are we involved? Well, at Google, we're always looking out for places where innovation isn't just talked about, but it's actually happening. And when I first met Tim and the broader uh, partnership um, here in South Yorkshire, it became really obvious that that was happening in spades. 
whether it's through the citizen jury piece that you were talking about or the collaboration and the breadth of partnership that you've put together, it was really obvious that this is where innovation is starting to breathe. So for us, there are two things, there are two reasons this feels really important. One is that we know as Google, we work best at the intersection of where academia, public services and industry come together, bringing all of those different skills together to really drive things forward. So we have that. Um, and we're also best as Google when we have the ability to bring all of our products and skills from across our business to a place and really be multiplicative in what we're doing. So whether that's YouTube Health with our amazing group of clinical creators we have, whether that's through how we think about using Fitbits or Pixel Watches and Android phones, whether that's through infrastructure like Google Cloud, if we can bring all of those to work with partnerships like this, we know we can have the biggest impact on people's health. So that's what we want to be doing. And so our partnership involves a few things. Firstly, um, we were really delighted to be able to donate 500 digital skills scholarships, so training up local people in how to use these technologies properly in the health space so that they can really feel comfortable about it. We did a big survey last year with NHS Confed, actually, around uh, sort of people's comfort around using digital technology, and we know that, that consumers want to use digital technology for their health but feel anxious about doing so and fear of being left behind. So that skills piece is really important. We've also donated 30 digital skills apprenticeships to the South Yorkshire region to try and really foster that, that spirit of innovation. And then we're bringing also research opportunities. So we've just kicked off a research study with Tim and his team called Pumas, which is looking at using AI to see whether we can, using sensors on phones, um, diagnose conditions like hypertension or kidney disease earlier and give consumers the ability to do that. So sort of testing a sensor on a smartphone against medical grade equipment to see whether we can put technology into the hands of patients to give them more control over their health. So that's sort of a quick run through what we're doing and why we want to be involved. Thanks, Sue. That's really helpful. I mean, I guess one of the, the thoughts that's, that's on my mind is around, um, you know, uh, making um, uh, 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 making this, this technology accessible. And I think one of the things that we, we worry about is, is digital exclusion and people feeling that they're not able to, to take advantage of this. I mean, Tim, I just wonder whether, uh, you know, th that's, that, that's an area of, of consideration within the, within the program. Oh, completely. Uh, and, you know, I suppose it's, it's really important to recognize that digital health innovation can make inequalities worse if done incorrectly, but it can also make them better if it's done with the appropriate approach. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that citizens are involved at the very start, before we decide exactly what projects we will be funding. And we have over a million pounds worth of seed funding to get these projects rolling. But before we allocate that funding, we need to check that it won't inadvertently worsen the things that you talked about. But some of the principles are pretty clear. We don't assume that people own devices. If they need devices for their health care, we provide the devices, and Sue's talked about the Fitbits that have uh, been the start of that. We don't assume that people can use the technologies. If they require use of technologies, they need to be trained in them, or ideally, they should be so low complexity that you can just pick it up and deal with it. So one example is, you know, I really want to know, I'm a cardiologist, when do people get chest pain? We just give them a button, it's just one button. Just press the button when you get chest pain. That's all you need to do. It's not rocket science, but it is a sensible application of digital technologies that allows people to know that their symptoms are being recorded and taken into account in clinical decision making. So we could go on with different examples, but um, those are the ways that we're beginning to try and negotiate this balance between accepting that the status quo is not acceptable, or it is, we, have to, we have to move forwards, but also not steering in the wrong direction. I mean, and that's I really helpful. Sorry, Sue, go I was, ahead. I was just going to jump in on that, if I can. Digital exclusion, obviously, is top of mind for us. Um, and as Tim said, you know, lots of ways of thinking about that. People might have a smartphone, but might not be able to afford the data package that's needed to upload information yeah. to go back to the clinician, for instance. So how can we help with that? But actually, what we, what we do know is that the vast majority of of sort of working adults, or adults in fact, have a smartphone, and people have, are increasingly comfortable from all walks of life at using technology for their banking, for their holidays, for their shopping. And yes, health is different because there's personal information and so on, but what we do know is that 
as long as we can reassure people that privacy levels are being met, people are really comfortable about sharing their health data if they can see the benefit back. And actually, technology can be a way of avoiding, of, of avoiding some of those inequalities. We know, for instance, that over 50% of people don't take up cardiac rehab after heart attacks. And many of those people are from lower socioeconomic groups because the class is held at a time when the bus doesn't run. And so if you can't get there because the bus, route, the bus isn't running, you don't go to the class. Imagine a world where we can do that with individuals virtually by giving them a phone, a data package, and a wearable where they can then take control of that and have access to it. So I think we have to be aware that whilst we need to be always thinking about not excluding people, actually technology has the ability to include people more in their health as well. That's really helpful. I mean, I mean, one of the, I mean, Tim, when when you were speaking to me, you used the word assume quite a lot, and I think um, that's often a pitfall that I think leaders in health and care, you know, are, 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 you know, fall into. We're guilty of is making assumptions about what people need and what what's likely to be effective. But you talked about the um, the, the, the the systems uh, jury. I think you described it, Could, and I'm so I'm really intrigued by that idea. Could you tell us a little bit about how how that worked? And I mean, you've t I suspect you've touched on some of the outputs, but I'm I'm interested in the, the kind of process of engagement. So we work with a, a partner called Hopkins Van Mill that are kind of well established in in doing this qualitative research. We uh, recruited 12 diverse Sheffield citizens from different backgrounds, and we put a lot of effort into making sure that they were representative, they were drawn from the different wards within Sheffield, they weren't just people from the more affluent areas. Uh, and we'll be running this again in other places, because I think one of the things, one of the, one of the many inequalities is, you know, you tend to get more research and activity in university towns, and it doesn't filter into the old mining towns that, that David's spoken about. Uh, and we set them the challenge of what, you know, what should be our principles and what should be our priorities. And all this is available. I'd be delighted to share it later on. But the, you know, the principles are safeguarding people's privacy, um, improving accessibility. And then some of the priorities were mental health, living with um, uh, chronic illness. And one thing that I hadn't perhaps predicted was end-of-life care. And it was just like, oh, yeah, of course, that's a... Everyone gets there, uh, and one of, the f one of the healthcare organizations we hadn't thought to engage with was hospice care, because as you know, it kind of sits outside the NHS structures to a certain extent, certainly wasn't on my immediate. So we're now partnering with St. Luke's Hospice to drive forward digital innovation in end-of-life care. So, that, so that's an example of you know, real changes in response to citizens' voices. Really helpful. I think, I think those practical applications really help to get what could be quite a conceptual yeah. Uh, you know, kind of uh, framework into into kind of yeah. real life. So really helpful. David, do you want to comment? Yeah, please. Um, I was sort, sort to expand on the role of the ICB in this, and I think that people would hope that collaboration and integration are the kind of um, you know the leading star of, of of what the Health and Care Act was about. But um, al alongside being the chief medical officer, I chair a delivery group for research and innovation, digital, and also the pop health management, health inequalities. And I think. Hopefully, Tim, you've seen that that group has enabled us to connect people together because there's a wealth of enthusiasm out there, but it's actually knowing who the connectors are within our communities, within our voluntary sector. So I think having our ICB approach of starting with people strategy isn't something that's over here. It's kind of embedded, and we're, we're actually seeing the benefits that are coming in, not just this program, but a series of programs. Um, I can't um, highlight high enough that, you know, the kind of working with people in the community because we have had a, a behavioral science approach if it's not just the information we know that will be helpful it's the way we connect with our populations so they see it's important as well so i think it's important for us that you know that, that uh, the way we behave is as important as the things we're doing mm. Tim. yeah I, I suppose one of the key things that the hub funding allows us to do is pay people for their time i mean patient and public involvement has often required patients and the public to come to us to uh, do it voluntarily or at the very most for kind of rather uh, modest rates of recompense. And so we've got, for the first time in my career actually, a very generous budget which we will use to get that voice so that we're not constantly exploiting people and we can actually provide mutual benefit back to those communities. I think that's really important and I think we can't do patient and public involvement properly without funding it properly. 
and it's and that, great and news. that's important and we were fortunate that we received some money as many other areas were for the research engagement networks and we set up our voluntary sector we actually handed all of that money across our voluntary sector which feels kind of strange in the nhs to give that trust to um you know uh, representatives um but the working together research one of the elements they fed back was actually treat us as equal partners yep. in that yep. so yep. Um, you know acknowledging people's time and, and and supporting them with resource not always money but some resources is, is equally um vital i think that role of the voluntary sector is is potentially really really critical i mean as you mentioned before i mean there is a there is a potential for certain parts of our community or you know um you know less less able to access you know the opportunities of of research and innovation and i think actually working through um, particularly voluntary, voluntary organisations, faith groups, etc. That, that I think, to be frank, can reach parts of the community that actually formal organisations struggle with. I think is a really, um, you know, p potentially game-changing kind of um, kind of opportunity. T Tim, just on a, on a slightly different tack. Um, I mean, it, measurement of the impact. I mean, how how will you know what 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 effect this is having? That's a great. I mean, the longer term, we want to be judged by improved outcomes and reduced inequalities but that's obviously a long-term challenge that all of us share in the shorter term um, th there is the skills and training which is required and so there's the quality of the programs that we offer and, and Sue's talked about the uh, contribution that Google have made is really high and the number of people that access so if people want to access this training please do get in contact uh, it's going to be available to everyone there's academic outputs right I'm a, I'm a ivory tower academic there's papers and grants and things and you know we've we won four million pounds. We've since been awarded over 14 million pounds in other funding. So it does leverage this kind of uh, funding. But there's also economic impacts in terms of bringing companies and jobs and apprenticeships to the region. And those are the kind of intermediate milestones by which we will get to improved health outcomes. I, mean, I think that's such an important point. And I've mentioned the work that we're doing jointly with the, um, the South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined Authority. And oddly enough, health isn't part of the mayor's remit. But ha having, having said that, in South Yorkshire, uh, the mayor has made a very clear commitment to, uh, to, to, to contributing to uh, you know, the challenges of improving health. But interestingly, if I, if I look at our integrated care partnership, um, we've got kind of four objectives, you know, um, best start in life for children, young people, um, addressing health inequalities, but the, the remaining two are actually about employment and the relationship between work and health, so partly around how do we upskill the health and care workforce, and also how do we um, you know, increase economic participation in, the, in our communities. I mean, Sue, you mentioned the, the apprenticeships and the, the, you know, the skills development. I mean, that seems to, 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 to speak to that, that kind of part of the agenda. Uh, absolutely, and I think as we see digital technologies only in increase in how they're being used, not just in health, but across sort of working, uh, our working lives, particularly now with this sort of the explosion of generative AI, and we know that that's going to change things again, getting people skilled up in that is going to be really important. You mentioned the, um, the Merrill Combined Authority. I think one of, the, um, one of the reasons this partnership feels different to many that we've seen is that there is this complete alignment across so many different parts of the ecosystem and that that this isn't just about health health is a really important part of it but you know you see the investment that is coming in manufacturing david talked about this being a really the heritage of manufacturing in south yorkshire both in in steel but also in the coal mining and that all disappeared but we've seen the recent investment from rolls royce and um, uh, aerospace into the region and you've got the advanced manufacturing research going on there. So all of these things, these, these bits at the 85% that David talked about that aren't within the, the regular bit of your health are all going to contribute to uh, driving out uh, improved health outcomes and reducing those health inequalities. We think the bit that we can do alongside as Google is provide the products that really can accelerate that. Thanks, Sue. I mean, David, just to, just to go back to you, I mean, you've got a, kind of got a kind of unique experience, really, as a practice, practice, practicing cl clinician, actually on the patch, as well as the uh, the ICS's lead for innovation technology digital. Um, I'm just wondering about, you know, what opportunities do you see in terms of um, in terms of your kind of lived experience of the, the needs of the people in 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 the community that you serve? Well, I think we saw through the pandemic how people um, kind of 
took to, to digital, both clinicians who moved to online consultations, but also how people um, utilized healthcare in a different way, and whether that you know, was, was via a, a sort of an electronic message or you know, got prompt about their appointments, their health needs. Um, so, you know, I think we've been trying to do this for quite a while, and I think you know, none of us are going to sit here and think that COVID was a good thing, but actually some of the digital advancements have taken us on much quicker than, than we would have done. I think um, I'm conscious that you know, we can be overwhelmed with lots of data, though, and there's a difference between data and intelligence, and I think we look towards um, you know, some analysts to be able to understand that data so that we can be a bit more focused and target, targeted, because you know, this, this is a big elephant to eat all in one, so we need to chunk it up is actually where's the prioritization of where do we get the biggest impact, where do people get the biggest benefits. So, um, I, you know, I think he health has to move with the times as the rest of our lives have with digital, and I think sometimes we're a little bit behind. So um, I'd be optimistic but cautious in, some, in the ways that we, um, we maybe implement this, but I think you've picked up on that already about, t you know, taking our... Um, staff with us as much as yeah, our public. Really. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess, I mean, I mean, we've talked quite a bit about South Yorkshire, and obviously I'm, I'm jolly pleased that we have. Um, but I'm kind of thinking about how do, how do we do this work in a way that generates wider learning? And I guess uh, it's probably a question for yourself, Sue, in, in terms of the kind of opportunity for scalability and, 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 and kind of how, could, how can we take the learning from this experience and apply it in other, in other parts of... Yeah. Um, we, I mean, we, we want everybody to be looking at South Yorkshire and going, I want, I want one of those in my patch. That's our, that will be another measure of success for us, that we've got people sort of enviously looking, going, that collaboration that they've built is really super. And we've started conversations already um, with, with colleagues that we're working with in Manchester. We have relationships in London, et cetera, about how we can do this. Bits of it are easily scalable and transferable, particularly around the training um, and the digital skills. And we've started to think, how can we really bespoke some of our broader digital skills training for the NHS, for health and care workers, and also for helping health and care workers train consumers to use uh, those digital skills. And we know those bits will be transferable. So we're really excited about sort of both making sh uh, South Yorkshire bigger and better and really driving success there, but then seeding into other bits of the UK and further abroad if, if we can. And, and, in, and in terms of sort of thinking forward about that vision, I mean, what, I don't know whether it's five years out, 10 years out, but what, you know, for you, what do, what do you think good would be, what, what would good look like for, for, for the NHS in this space? Um, so from a, I guess from a NHS perspective rather than a Google perspective, what we would want to be seeing is that bus route that David talked about. I can't remember the number of the bus that runs across Sheffield, but with the 83, <laughs> with the 20-year healthy life expectancy difference, we'd want to see that, that changing, right? We, you know, in, in 10, 15 years' time, that's the sort of timescale we're going to be needing to think about measuring ourselves on. And for Google, for me personally, what we'd love to see is that our products are contributing to that so that, you know, there are... Lots of people walking around with a, a smartwatch, and there are many different smartwatches. It doesn't have to be just a Google one. We think ours are great, um, <laughs> and um, you know, being feeling confident about using these technologies to really take control of their health. If we can see ourselves embedded in an ecosystem like this, then then I know we'll have done the right thing. Perfect. So I mean, I think it's an exciting vision. Thanks for that, Sue. I mean, I'm I'm conscious of time, and we have got. To, I, I can actually see. Um, some Slido uh, questions and comments, so I think maybe uh, maybe take some of that that response from from your good selves and see what the panel make, makes of it. So uh, I mean, I mean actually the, the most popular question there's a, there's a question around um, the uh, digital exclusion, which I think we've we've touched on already. But I don't know if there's any any further comments people want to make make on that. Well, the, the question is particularly around uh, a challenge for those with learning disabilities and older people, and how is this being addressed? I mean. If, maybe if I start from how we're thinking about that from a Google perspective, and then Tim, you, you can back up on it. We are um, absolutely focused on making our technologies as accessible as they can be for everybody, and we know that we need to consider these, these different groups. Um, and one of the big things that we're doing is thinking about how can we um, also help carers work with 
their, their relatives, you know. So w we did some work during uh, lockdown, I, I, without talking too much about cardiac rehab, but looking at turning a cardiac rehab program into a virtual program. And one of the things we saw that made it successful was when people got their families involved and were able to sort of engage more broadly. So I think there are lots of mechanisms for helping older people stay involved. We've got a number of things that we're doing around accessibility, so speech recognition for people with dysarthria, for example, after a stroke or with motor neuron disease. So making sure that, that if you're trying to access healthcare, you're able to you know, do it as effectively as other people. Or if you're trying to access buying a coffee, you're able to do it as effectively as everybody else because you can use Translate to help you with that. So I think there's lots of opportunities and accessibility is one of the driving things for Google in all of our products, making sure that we can uh, make as many people have access as possible. Mm. Thanks, Sue. Um, just, just pick up a, another question. I mean, it's probably one for you, David, which is um, a, about a kind of worry about clinicians, particularly in primary care, being overwhelmed by data. So there's something about, well, how does this help? Uh, you know, we know the, the pressures that are on general practice particularly, but how does it help frontline clinicians in those roles to, 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 to do their job better? So for this program, probably there's, there's elements, but, but probably not specifically on that. But um, I think I touched on this before. It's turning data into intelligence and actually utilising it to be better at the services we do have available are targeted in a way that's got better impacts. I, I do, and everyone will, will remember or hear the uh, eight o'clock rush to get an appointment. Well, actually, there are other avenues that can help us support that. Um, so I think that, you know, be more focused on need rather than want. I think, you know, the digital technology can, can assist in, in doing that. So, um, you know, I think the health service is always going to have a, a, a capacity demand dilemma, but, but I think we can use technology better so that, you know, the people I talked about with um, poorer um, health um, outcomes, actually the ones who struggle to get into our traditional services. So, you know, while there is risk for digital, I just wanted to come in while, while I've got the mic and just saying that we shouldn't use age and think that people will be turned off because mm. my mother's 80 and she does all her banking online. She uses the NHS app. Um, so, you know, she has, you know, it's kind of revolutioned her, her life. So I think that we make presumptions of who can and can't use. And I think learning disability, actually, there is technology that can be blended for, for their needs um, that we often don't do in person. Thanks, David. I, I'd probably just time for, for one more, more question, and I'll invite uh, uh, colleagues maybe just to say some, some last words. But there's a question about, about um, uh, I, I guess, public confidence and digital security, referencing recent uh, cyber attacks on, on pathology. Any thoughts on, on how do we, how do we um, ensure the data is safe and that, that the public can have confidence in? Yeah, I mean, it's a key question. Uh, it, it, in some ways, it's easier from our point of view as a research organization because we uh, anonymize or de-identify the data uh, and it doesn't need to be linked to, to identifiable uh, information in a way that it does if you need to feed it back into. So we'll develop the tools in a reasonably secure way and then later on they're going to need to be implemented. We do work with the National Cyber Security Centre um, because it really is important to make sure that apps are penetration tested and, and that, that you know, information can't leak out of those kind of things. Um, but clearly, uh, you know, as has been referenced, we already face cyber security threats. It's not like digital health is making this a thing. It is a thing in the same way that data overload is already a thing. We're not making that worse. It's already happening as a clinician now. I'm completely overwhelmed by the amount of digital and, and analog data that I have on each individual. So uh, we're not creating these issues. Actually, I think it is about finding the solutions to them. Thanks, Tim. So, David, any final comments? So I, I think there are three elements um, for this to be successful. I think it is about building relationships and trust. I think there's a having an aligned vision and goal, which I think we've got set out by Integrated Care Partnership Strategy and continuing to be curious and questioning the way we do things. Um, if you're interested, get in contact, uh, easily Googleable, as it were, um, to be found, and uh, be very grateful to get your thoughts, comments, advice, and, and kind of critical friend uh, suggestions. Perfect. Sue? Uh, yeah, I think both of those comments are, are spot on. I think for this to be successful, growing this collaboration, bringing in more partners. I think the voluntary sector, as you talked about, Gavin, is really important, Get, getting into local groups so that we can understand better 
local needs and not just make presumptions, which we all end up doing, um, and sticking with it. The, the benefits of this, yes, we'll see some of them in the short term, but actually a lot of them are going to be yeah. one, two, five, ten years. And that's hard in the world that we live in, where budgets are set on an annual basis, where results are demanded now, now, now. We have to be patient and say, we're all in this for the long run, and we know that this is going to work. Hold ourselves to account collectively, and we will deliver. So, and yeah, that, that's probably it. Thanks, Sue. And, and, and one, th you know, it, it was great to have, uh, you know, kind of the input of colleagues into this session today. And obviously, Google Health is is sponsoring the the um, the, 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 the the Comfort Expo as well. So, uh, really good to ha to have you here. And we will be all all of us will be um, around for further conversations. We've got our stand in the middle of the uh, conference center. Please come and grab any of us for a conversation about what what we're doing and what we will be doing. Thanks. So, I mean, and just to thank everybody here, really, one, for, for giving us your, your time and your attention. Uh, this is still quite early days in, in, in this particular uh, project, but I hope that exploration has given you a bit of a sense of some of the challenges we're, we're wrestling with in South Yorkshire, which I suspect will be familiar to many of you, but also how we're leveraging uh, digital technology, but in a way that generally engages communities to, to, to tackle some of those challenges. So, thanks for your attention, and it's been a, a, been a, a pleasure to... Uh, to be here with you this morning. Thank you.